Read um, a few more a few more lines by him, and then uh, and then and then. Um, if we are truly free and live in a free country, when shall I be without this heaviness of mind? When shall I have peace? Christ did not come to redeem our sins. The Christ child was not obedient to his parents. The kingdom of heaven did not mean the next life. No one in business can be a Christian. The two worlds are both in this world. So there's a kind of hilarity here, along with the sort of ferocious political energy, like this line about the Christ child not being obedient to his parents, or no one in business can be a Christian. The speaker doesn't mean these statements as absolute, but is sort of creating this hybrid of ferocity and joyfulness and satire and grief. And it's one of many artful things about his poems. Um, he has a spiritual background that makes him a deeper poet than a, a, your average political poet. And um, I would love to say more about it, but I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going, to, going, to, going to give it up now. But I want to say that um, our circumstances culturally have not changed since that time. And I wonder where the poetry that addresses those circumstances is. Um, uh, if um, the heart moves around, poetry taps into the heart, the last thing I want to see is poetry become a salon art. And I see signs in the current poetry atmosphere of both a love of dissemblage, a certain kind of irrationality, although not spiritual irrationality, and a great emphasis uh, on, on, on the intellect, a great kind of conceptual infatuation with the conceptual. So I don't think that that's what poetry should be doing in America. I'm not going to consent to that version of, uh, of, of poetry. And it, it, it seems oblivious to the, to, to the fact that the source of poetry, the reason we read it, is an experience. We have a deep thirst for meaning. Poetry needs to be judged on its irrationality, its relevance to the cultural moment, its existential stakes. And that's really you know, what is important uh, right now, I believe, about art. And that's why the NBA has to remain partisan and continue to be skeptical and uh, and, and, and towards aesthetic fashions and also um, remember existential passionate motives for reading and writing poetry and making it generally culturally relevant. I'm sorry, Jim, I ran over. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's a particular pleasure to be on this panel with these people. Um, uh, it seems to me, as I look over the last 50 or 60 years of American poetry, that our poetry has existed most visibly as the fringes of itself. What has constituted legitimate ambition or accomplishment has, for better and for worse, been signaled most often by manner and quirk as if it were the artist's job not to engage the most potent aspects of Dickinson or Eliot, but to sequester herself in one or another schoolroom, buoyed by the camaraderie with other well-tutored students sitting obediently, if stylishly, in rows. The schoolroom for formalists, the schoolroom for experimentalists, the schoolroom for experimentalists for whom other experimentalists are not experimental enough. <laughs> the degeneration of these terms, hijacked by the renegade engines of taste, would portend the degeneration of the art. Except that while 50 years is a long time in the life of one artist, it is in the history of art nothing, the blink of an eye. Think quickly. How many poets who flourished in the 19th century have you read with any lasting attention? Eight? Maybe 10? Did you ever get around to Swinburne, who at the end of the 19th century was considered by many people to be the greatest living poet? 100 years from now, a person who cares a great deal about poetry will probably have read eight or 10 poets from the 20th century. Let's see. Frost, Eliot, Stevens, Pound, Auden, Williams, 
wait, that's already six, and they're all white guys. Uh, three of them won the National Book Award. Three of them did not. Will Elizabeth Bishop or George Oppen be read at the end of the 21st century? Will anyone have heard of John Berryman? What about James Merrill or Gwendolyn Brooks? What about Sylvia Plath? What about Hart Crane? Needless to say, these are all great poets. And so is Swinburne. Future readers will probably have heard of some of the schoolrooms with which some of these poets have been associated, confessionalism or objectivism or whatever, just as readers of poetry today may be familiar with the Imagist movement or the Rhymers Club. We don't read William Butler Yeats because he was a member of the Rhymers Club, <laughs> or Ezra Pound because he was a driving force behind the Imagist movement, but if we've heard of Lionel Johnson, or Richard Aldington, we've heard of them probably because they were once associated with these schoolrooms. Johnson and Aldington were serious artists. They made beautiful poems, but like most of their contemporaries, they are players in the passing history of taste. To look back on the last 50 years of American poetry as it's registered in the National Book Award is inevitably to think about the history of taste, which is not automatically the same thing as the history of art, though on rare occasions it might be. For while it's almost impossible to find an enduring place in the history of art, it's easier to make a name for yourself in the history of taste. You can win a prize. You can sell a lot of books. It's consoling to see that the first three names in the long list of National Book Award winners are William Carlos Williams, Wallace Stevens, and Marion Moore. But these poets are not part of the history of art because they won prizes, or because they were noticed by the right critic, or because they were associated with a cool schoolroom. All the schoolrooms are driven by the logic of the imitable manner by a mode of writing that can be learned quickly from like-minded contemporaries, alleviating poets from the less congratulatory work of learning from inimitable predecessors. Yeats did not become Yeats by hanging out in Brooklyn with Lionel Johnson. He became Yeats by spending long, often unrewarding hours with Shelley and Dunn poets whose achievement he could only dream of approaching. What has happened to that kind of energy in contemporary American poetry? Is it represented by the last three names on the long list of National Book Award winners? Mark Doty, Keith Waldrop, Terence Hayes? Like Lionel Johnson, like Conrad Aiken, like Mona Van Doyne, like William Bronck, these poets have written beautiful poems. Will any of them have a place in the history of art? No one sitting in this room here tonight will live long enough to know. There is no greater sin after the seven deadly, said John Keats, than to flatter oneself into the idea of being a great poet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thought I'd offer a few thoughts or uh, notations rather than something more discursive. Um, a series of haikus, some rhyming, channeling some thoughts about U.S. poetry from 1950 onward um, and the NBA list. So, uh, some haiku divigations, uh, starting off with a haiku of Basho's translated by Robert Haas. Even in Kyoto, hearing the cuckoos cry, I long for Kyoto. Prize-giving season, even in New York City, I long for New York. <laughs> Isa to spiders, don't worry, poets, I keep house casually. National Book Award haiku, what's national here? 
American Century, American Books, Saluting the Greats, Single Volumes, Collected, The Establishment Rates. But what's not to like? Wallace Stevens, Auroras of Autumn, Deep Lake. Not to be English, yet to write in an English. American Fate, Spanish, Mandarin, what language will the future write our poems in? Race, class, and gender, a few ladies, fewer blacks. Let's mix it up, folks. A thought from Ezra Pound. That the good poems get written, not who writes them. This is what matters. Death of poetry haiku. Poetry is dead. You all know this very well. Long live poetry. Poetry today, broader church one must concede than 1950. But variety might not mean strength. In this case, though, I'd say it does. Orient diction, epic poem, serial poem, vernacular splat. Expansive, restrained, Americans blab and then grow silent again. The house was quiet and the world was calm. What bed to lay your head on? On the genealogies and camps of US poetry. Consider Perloff, Pound Stevens, whose era? Well, looks like it's still both. Rattle your chains, folks. Tradition, experiment, tired debates persist. Pale face, Indians, raw or cooked, new formalisms, innovate or die. Obama Nation, National Book Foundation, New Model Nation. What to say about Conrad Aiken, Howard Moss? News that stays news? Hmm. Not the one who wants to, but the one who can. That one keeps poetry hot. So Montale said about tradition, altered for this evening. Information glut. Critics pull out their sack butts and blow their tut tuts. Raising their glasses, chattering classes, cheap, cheap, indifferent masses. Too many writers, not enough readers, print dead, boo hoo poetry. Poetry is dead. You all know this very well. Long live poetry. Percy Bysshe Shelley haiku. Poetry is connate with the origin of man. Man, poems, both still here. U.S. poetry, still singing the song of self? Fine, if it's well sung. The fetish of voice. Blah, de blah, 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 blah. Still, some voices ring. Sage poets wonder, is epic possible now? Cherry trees blossom. On periodization and this evening, post-war poetry, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, still war poetry. Red Scare, Tea Party, poem including history, strange new century. Facebook, YouTube, pop, sexting, terror, flash mobs, hip hop, make the era pop. Williams had no blog. Stevens had no website. Frogs sing from a bog. Nationalism, capitalism, I'll take Frank O'Hara's personism. Nostalgia is gross. Good old days were good for some, likely not for most. On poets' day jobs, insurance lawyer, doctor, soldier, mom, teacher, teacher, teach. On recent deaths, to Stanley Kunitz, sayonara, rest in peace, Ayogawa. On those who never won a National Book Award in poetry, alternate roster, Duncan, Levertoff, Brooks, Glick, look good on poster. Losers take a bow. Who reads Scott and Southey now? All go under plow. On the most recent NBA in poetry, 
spirit of the age, 